In the three previous videos, we were studying second order linear differential equations of the form ay prime prime plus by prime plus cy equals zero, where a, b, and c are just constant coefficients with a not zero. We said anytime you see this kind of homogeneous second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients, what you want to do is immediately write down your characteristic or auxiliary equation. So this has the form ar squared plus br plus c equals zero where r is just a number. The solutions to this differential equation, which we can think of as the roots of this quadratic, they have the form negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Our first case that we considered was what happens when this discriminant inside the square root is positive? Then we get real and distinct roots. We handle that situation. Then we said, what if the discriminant was zero? Then we would have one real root of the form negative b divided by 2a. That root would be a repeated root. We handled that situation. Then in the last video, we said, what if the discriminant was negative? so that we were trying to take the square root of a negative number, that would produce a number which is not a real number. Additionally, we made a little extra constraint in that video, which was that we said that this leading term in the numerator was zero, so that we were looking at roots of the form plus or minus i times a number. Uh, because we would have no leading real part here, we would just have an imaginary number divided by 2a. So those are what we call pure imaginary roots. And this final look at the uh, kind of case-by-case -case situation that we find whenever we take the roots of the characteristic equation, we are going to consider that the discriminant is zero, or sorry, less than zero. Let me write that down. We want to consider the case that b squared minus 4ac is less than zero. And our conversation right now is going to sort of assume that this leading term is non-zero because we've already looked at that case. But actually, everything I do in this video could also handle the situation that b is zero. So this is the broader vision of what happens when your discriminant is negative. Let me take this expression for the roots now, and I'm going to rearrange the terms. If we're assuming that b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, that means that if I flip the order here, 4ac minus b squared is greater than zero. So if I can imagine moving them to the right-hand side, and we get 4a squared, uh, 4ac minus b squared is greater than zero. I'm going to use that right now because I'm going to say that these roots could be written as negative b divided by 2a plus or minus negative one times this number. That actually reverts us back to b squared minus 4ac, all inside the square root. So if I take the negative one out, I'm going to get i times the square root of 4ac minus b squared divided by 2a. The reason why I did this is that each of these components gets a name. This is going to be called the real number alpha, and this is going to be called the real number beta, the same beta that we saw in the previous video. The same idea for beta, but now we imagine that we have perhaps an interesting non-zero alpha out here. So from this situation where this discriminant is negative, we get what are called complex conjugate roots, meaning they just differ by this sign in the middle. So one root is alpha plus i times beta, and the other root is alpha minus i times beta. With complex roots, what I'm going to do next is write down the general derivation behind the general form of the solution. So we would like to, once again, be able to say that any solution to such a differential equation of this form with these kinds of roots looks like a linear combination of two fundamental building block solutions. And then in the usual way, we will solve one example. Now we are going to derive the general form of the solution to the differential equation ay prime prime plus by prime plus cy equals zero in the situation where the roots are complex numbers.
If you're looking at this and thinking, hey, this looks a lot like the last video, that's good news because we're actually not going to do nearly as much work. We handled most of this computation when we studied pure imaginary roots. And the reason why is I can take this linear combination here and say, hey, property of exponents allows me to take those E terms and break them up into a product of exponentials. Okay, let me just go ahead and do it. So where I have E to the alpha plus I beta, all of that times X, uh, I think I will first distribute before I break it up. So let's write this as E to the alpha X plus I beta X. Okay, there's the first one. And then likewise, plus D2 times E to the alpha X minus I beta X. Using properties of exponents, what we can do next is say that this is e to the alpha x times e to the i beta x. And then similarly here, we'll have that leading coefficient d2, e to the alpha x times e to the negative i beta x. These terms both have the same exponential expression, e to the alpha x, so let's factor that in front of the sum so that we can say, hey, this is e to the alpha x times d1 e to the i beta x plus d2 e to the negative i beta x. And now this is good news because this sum here, which has the constants in it, so this e to the alpha x is kind of hanging out front, this is exactly what we handled in the previous video when we looked at pure imaginary roots. And that's really why I wanted to do that one separately because I felt like that computation was already big enough without including this exponential out front. But we saw what it took to take this combination and rewrite it as a linear combination of cosine and sine where the coefficients were all real. So I'm just gonna write dot, 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 see previous video. If you would like to see that derivation. And with that derivation, we can now say that the general form of the solution, uh, well, what we would do is we would take this sum here and replace it with C1 times cosine beta x plus C2 times sine beta x. What I'm going to do is keep the C1 and C2 kind of in front of the terms. I'd like to see them in front. I'm going to bring this exponential kind of in between them. Okay, all that to say that I'm going to write this as C1 e to the alpha x cosine beta x plus C2 e to the alpha x sine beta x. I mean, that's one way to write it. And when you do that, you see that the pair of fundamental solutions have the form e to the alpha x cosine beta x and e to the alpha x sine beta x. So that's, that's one way to present it as a linear combination of these two building block solutions. Or if you'd like, and sometimes I actually like this too, you can leave that exponential out front and say it's e to the alpha x times c1 cosine beta x plus c2 sine beta x. And there are reasons why you might prefer this one as well, but I just want to write these two out there. So this is what the general solution to such a differential equation would look like. Now let's see that on one example. Okay, let's look at this example, y prime prime minus 2y prime plus 5y equals zero. As we've had in previous videos, this is an initial value problem, but we don't worry about the initial conditions until we have the general solution. So let's pass immediately to our characteristic equation. That's going to look like r squared minus 2r plus 5 equals zero. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and use the quadratic equation so we can say that the roots have the form two, the so negative b, plus or minus the square root, b squared minus four ac. So b squared is four, minus four ac is minus 20, divided by two times one. Okay, so that's going to be two plus or minus the square root of negative 16, divided by two. So that's going to be, um, I'll keep it as one fraction two, plus or minus. Square root of 16 is four, but we have a negative here, so it's going to be four i. So 
divided by two. So this tells us that there are two roots. They are complex conjugates. The first one is two plus four i divided by two. Actually, let's divide by two. So one plus two i. The second root is the complex conjugate. It's one minus two i. So those are the complex conjugate roots for this characteristic equation. In comparison to how we presented this material, the number one is alpha and then two is beta. Okay, so alpha is one, beta is two. That means now that we're ready to write down the general form of the solution. So following the presentation that we saw, I will write it the first way, the general solution is going to be y of x equals a constant times e to the alpha x. I'll go ahead and write one x so that you can see that the alpha did go there. This doesn't really look like the number one, but that's what I was going for. One x. Okay, so e to the alpha x is e to the one x times cosine beta x. So that's cosine two x. Okay, that's like our first building block solution. And then to that, we'll add c two e to the one x sine two x. And that's it. So once again, the key is to figure out the roots correctly, identify what situation you're in, and then proceed to the general form of the solution. We do have initial values here. So we know that when the input x is zero, y is one and y prime is two. Go ahead and see what you can make of that. So plug in those initial conditions, see if you can set up a system of two equations for the two unknowns, C1 and C2, and then I will work it out. Let's start with the first initial condition. When x is zero, y is one. I'm gonna work that over here. The right-hand side will be one, and then I will have c1 times e to the zero, cosine of zero, plus c2 e to the zero, sine of zero. You need to know these, e to the zero is one, cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero, so that overall, this is one equals C1 times one times one plus zero. In other words, one equals C1. So we got the first constant. Differentiating is a little trickier here because we have the product rule in each of these terms. So what I'm going to do is take the derivative. And as I do so, I will include the fact that C1 is no longer unknown to us. It is the value one. So that we can say that Y prime is going to be one times Derivative of the first is derivative of e to the x, which is just e to the x. So we will have e to the x cosine two x, and then differentiating the second, it will be minus two e to the x sine of two x. Okay, so that's the derivative of the first part. And then plus, kind of same story here, it's just the trig function changed. So plus c two e to the x sine of two x, plus 2c2 e to the x cosine of 2x. So that is the derivative of the second. And I like to keep my work somewhat organized so those two computations don't move too close together. All right, when x is zero, the left-hand side should be two. So let's plug in x equals zero now. We will get e to the zero cosine of zero, which is one. Okay, so this is one times one minus two e to the zero times sine of zero, but sine of zero is zero. So let me write minus zero so that it's clear that this became zero. And then similarly, we will have plus zero. Okay. And then lastly, plus two c2 e to the zero cosine of zero. So e to the zero is one, cosine of zero is one, plus two c2. All right. So this looks like one equals two C2. So we can solve for C2 now and say that the other coefficient is one half. 
Okay, so we found the coefficients for this initial value problem. All we have to do is write it down. The initial value problem solution has the form C1 is 1. Uh, I'm just going to write e to the x this time. So e to the x cosine of 2x plus 1 half e to the x sine of 2x. All right, so that's what an exercise looks like when this kind of differential equation has a pair of complex conjugate roots.